So now I would like to introduce uh, our speaker tonight, Elizabeth Price. Um, a fellow member of Vancouver Master Gardeners, Jill Wright, first told me in May last year about Elizabeth Price's fabulous book, Native and Ornamental Conifers in the Pacific Northwest. Elizabeth, in this book, explains their identification, botany, and natural history. Being keen on learning ways of identifying all trees and being particularly poor myself at uh, identifying conifers, I bought Elizabeth's book and have since reviewed it for uh, Discovery Journal, Nature Vancouver's Discovery Journal, and I've been in correspondence with the author, so I feel as though I, I know Elizabeth a little bit, even though we only met tonight for the first time. So this is what Elizabeth tells me. She was born and raised in the Boston area. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature and Journalism from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. During her college years, she spent a couple of summers backpacking and climbing in Western Canada and the Western US. She moved west to the University of Arizona for graduate school and gained an MFA in creative writing there. Now a West Coast North American, she has never looked back. She and her husband lived in Vancouver, BC for a couple of years, not far from Lighthouse Park. That was back in the early to mid 1990s. They spent many happy hours walking in Stanley Park, a place dear to my heart, and hiking in the Whistler area, and they continued to visit the area. Elizabeth Price has been a certified Oregon State University Master Gardener since 2008 and has been leading workshops on conifers for other master gardeners and for the public for over a decade. This interest in conifers led to her writing a book on the subject, which uh, include the 1,000 plus extremely useful photographs, all of which she took. Oregon State University Press published her book in June 2022. She now works as a professional writer, editor, and curriculum designer. Please give a warm welcome to Elizabeth Price, Oregon State University Master Gardener, conifer book author, as she speaks about Pacific Northwest conifers, how they outcompete flowering trees and their uses in the ornamental landscape. Let me just get my pointer going here. Um, well, thank you for that lovely introduction, Nina, um, and for the wonderful review of my book in uh, the Discovery Journal. It was uh, as well as well written as it was entertaining. Um, uh, it was quite complimentary, and I really thank you for that. And I am very glad to be uh, addressing a, a group of people from Vancouver, a place that's very dear to my heart, and um, that, uh, as Nina said, that uh, my husband and I continue to to visit and hike. And we were just in Stanley Park a couple of years ago, the last time we were up there. And it was uh, as beautiful as ever, although I did see some of the, the big cedars had come down. Uh, so the talk tonight is going to be split into three topics. Uh, first, I'm going to address this uh, perplexing issue of why conifers are the dominant tree species in our region, as opposed to flowering trees, which is typical of most places in the planet. Um, and then I'm going to move on and talk about using native conifers as ornamental plants, and then finish with uh, some of my favorite non-native conifers as ornamental plants. So um, the answer to this question of why conifers are the dominant tree species in the Pacific Northwest um, over flowering trees has to do with photosynthesis. Um, but first, um, I want to mentioned that uh, before flowering plants showed up about 150 million years ago, conifers were the dominant tree species on the planet. And slowly over time, they uh, were displaced by flowering trees. And then uh, around 150 million years ago, uh, uh, you know, for, from that time until now, flowering trees have taken over and have become the dominant worldwide spe species. Uh, and during the uh, ice ages of the Pleistocene, uh, which were actually not one long cold period, but was a series of warm and cold pulses, uh, conifer species and other species retreated to the coast of the Pacific Northwest, where they uh, stayed during the cold pulses and then 
uh, moved out from uh, during the warm pulses. And so it was, this area was a refugium for species during the ice ages as well. Um, so as I said, the, the answer to why here uh, lies in photosynthesis uh, and that the longer the season for photosynthesis is, the more advantageous it is to be an evergreen plant. Uh, evergreen foliage costs the plant a lot more to produce. Uh, evergreen foliage must be stronger to withstand uh, the harsh winters and the longer um, grazing of animals on the foliage. Uh, and the foliage pays the plant back by photosynthesizing more uh, over its course of its life than a deciduous leaf uh, in the form of the outcome of photosynthesis, which is glucose. But that in itself isn't enough to explain why evergreens outcompete flowering trees in our region. One has to think about photosynthesis a little bit more uh, carefully. So anyone who's taken plant physiology knows that uh, photosynthesis is a, is a complex a series of chemical reactions that happens uh, simultaneously. However, at its most basic, this is the recipe for photosynthesis, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with. And for photosynthesis to recur, recur all four elements must be in place, carbon dioxide, water, light, and foliage. And so if we think about carbon dioxide, it is available everywhere um, all the time for plants to use. Water is available uh, seasonally uh, in places where soils freeze in the winter. Uh, this creates drought conditions for plants because water is unavailable. So in cold regions, for instance, in the interior of the country, uh, of the continent, uh, actually winter is, a, is the most limiting season for growth because uh, there are drought conditions due to fr frozen water. And then in places like the Pacific Northwest, where summers can be quite dry, uh, but winter and winter, the soils don't often freeze and the soils are not frozen on the shoulder seasons in spring and fall, uh, summer is often the most limiting season for plant growth because, and photosynthesis because water is unavailable, creating drought conditions. And light is, of course, available in varying degrees year round, but foliage is available on evergreens year round, but not on deciduous trees. Uh, I have created this photosynthesis calendar of sorts, comparing the Pacific Northwest and places in the interior where freezes, uh, soils freeze, um, and in both cases, comparing evergreen and deciduous plants. Uh, so starting with uh, the Pacific Northwest, uh, you can see that our, our, our drought in the summer creates some um, lack of photosynthesis for both deciduous and evergreen plants. And then in the, uh, the fall and the, uh, the spring and in the winter, uh, when there's no foliage on the plants, photosynthesis is not possible for deciduous plants. Um, and so you can just see by counting the green squares here, how much more opportunity there is for evergreen plants to photosynthesize in our region as a, compared with uh, deciduous plants where the season for photosynthesis is quite short. However, if you consider microclimates such as riparian areas, like here in the Portland area, the Columbia River, uh, along the Columbia River, there are no conifers growing. It is all deciduous plants uh, and trees and shrubs. And that is because they are, are able to access water in the summer through the high water table. And summer becomes a very productive season for those plants for photosynthesis and can outcompete evergreen conifers in that microclimate. Um, and is just sort of, I guess, the exception that proves the rule in this case. Um, it's, and I would say probably every riparian area is going to have, and our area is going to have you know, deciduous trees and shrubs rather than evergreens. Because uh, evergreens simply cannot compete when the deciduous plants have, you know, that incredibly productive long summer days to photosynthesize and create sugar for the plant to use for growth and other functions. And then if you look at 
think about the interior of the country. And in many parts of the East where summer rain, uh, where it really precipitates year round. Uh, unlike here, it's not so digital. Um, and summer is a highly productive time for photosynthesis for both evergreen and deciduous plants. Um, and then winter drought creates um, conditions for evergreens that they can't photosynthesize. And of course, deciduous plants aren't able to, uh, to photosynthesize either. And so one might think, well, this makes it equally you know, advantageous to be evergreen or deciduous in these conditions. However, evergreen foliage is so much more expensive for the plant to create that it actually tips the scales for deciduous uh, trees. Uh, Deciduous, it's much more efficient just to make uh, inexpensive disposable foliage in this in this situation than to create the mo more expensive evergreen foliage. Um, and if you think about um, the mountains, uh, why why are conifers dominant in places like the mountains and in boreal forests? Um, it's for two reasons. Uh, one is that conifers are much more um, adapted to drawing nutrients out of poor soil. And mountain soil is very poor due to how slowly organic matter decomposes in cold, in cold soils. And also um, during conditions of drought, whether that be winter drought or summer drought, uh, the water column in the xylem of plants can become interrupted um, and bubbles can form in the xylem embolisms that could be quite damaging to the plant. And conifers, the anatomy of uh, xylem and conifers is such that uh, bubbles do not travel between cells. The bubbles are sequestered in the cell and do not travel from cell to cell uh, in, in limit damage where deciduous trees, flowering trees do not have that ability. So in conditions like uh, you know, mountains and, and boreal forests or high deserts, this creates um, where you have, in many ways, you know, summer drought and winter drought. Uh, conifers still dominate because of those factors. And um, and if you think about high deserts, you know, here in Oregon we have Bend, Oregon, which is a high desert around uh, 3,500 feet. And then, if you've ever traveled to Santa Fe, you see high deserts there, and they're both dominated by conifers and the same composition of conifers. You know, in in, in Bend here on the east side, we have um, ponderosa pines and uh, western junipers and lodgepole pines. And in Santa Fe, you also have the same composition. You have junipers and pines. You have uh, the single seed juniper and the uh, single, uh, the uh, pinion pine. And pines, uh, people, I think most people realize that junipers are very well adapted to hot and cold and uh, conditions uh, and drought conditions. But pines are also, as a group, there are exceptions, but as a group, pines are also very well adapted to uh, extreme uh, conditions like uh, hot and cold and drought. So um, this is a very deep topic that I've just sort of uh, brushed uh, against here. And I really, it's very, very fascinating and there's a lot written on it. Um, but, you know, I've often, you know, before I researched this topic for the book, I, I had often wondered, you know, why here? Why was this place, you know, much like the Jurassic? <laughs> um, okay, now I'm going to transition to talking about native uh, Pacific Northwest conifers as ornamental plants. And first I wanna talk a little bit about cotyledons. Um, flowering plants are typically taught as the standard in botany classes and horticulture classes because it's what most people are most familiar with. Um, and of course, flowering plants are broken into monocots and dicots, one or two cotyledons. But conifers um, in the pine family have numerous cotyledons. Um, and it, it differs from species to species and even within a species. For instance, this is a grand fir seedling over here. Grand firs have between four and seven cotyledons which are these, this umbrella, downward facing umbrella of foliage here. And this on the inside is the, the juvenile fo foliage starting to grow. And down here is a Douglas fir, which has five to seven cotyledons per plant. Uh, and they tend to be upward facing and pointy. Um, 
and these are conifers of the lowlands that seed down among us, you know, the ones that, you know, the Western red cedar also seed down and um, the Western hemlock also seeds down. Uh, and we, we find them growing in our yards. I find all, found all of these plants growing in my yard. Um, and they tend to be stealthful because conifers are not weedy and they sort of show up one or two here and there. And you don't quite notice them until maybe they're growing out of the center of a shrub. Um, just the other day, I pulled probably a, a four or five year old Western red cedar growing up right through another low pine shrub that I had, you know, and they like the, the, the shady kind of moist conditions under other plants are, you know, conducive for seedlings. It, they're moister and they have more shade. Um, but even at this young stage here, you can identify conifers. A uh, seedling ID is one of my pastimes. <laughs> and, uh, but you can see that here, there are different differences between these two plants that allow you to identify them. The cotyledons here, downward face and are blunt. And the cotyledons on the Douglas fir are upward facing and pointy. And here, this sweet little uh, grand fir uh, seedling has its very first terminal bud, which is small, round, red, and pitchy, which is typical for the species. And unfortunately, you can't see the Douglas fir bud here, but if you were to, it would be round and pointy and hard, and you would be able to differentiate these two, even at this very tiny age, young age. Uh, incense cedars aren't native north of uh, central Oregon, but they're very popular, popular ornamentally, and they seed down very readily. They are very, very hardy seedlings, and they can tolerate a lot of abuse. They're drought tolerant and pollution tolerant and tolerant to all sorts of things. Uh, and most plants in the cypress family have two cotyledons, and incense cedar has these very long, large, wide cotyledons that make it very, very obvious and very easy to, to pick out in the landscape. Um, and if you have any incense cedars growing around you ornamentally, you probably have these coming up in your yard. And they're very, um, you know, um, they're very nice ornamental plants. And if you see them, it's nice to, to dig them up and put them in a pot and grow them and maybe, you know, plant it somewhere where you want it to grow. Um, and over here is a shore pine and, um, this also I pulled up out of my yard. Uh, and I, I use this as an example to show that the juvenile foliage of pines is actually linear and not in bundles like the adult foliage. And you can see the cotyledons that have shriveled up down here. And here's the, the juvenile um, foliage that is in bundle together. And then you see the, the seedling do, uh, with its mature foliage up here um, in fascicles of two. Um, so we have these lowland conifers that, uh, you know, we typically don't plant so much, but they just show up where they want to. Um, but many of them are simply too large for most uh, home gardens. So they become very, very large trees. Uh, and that, oh, I also wanted to, um, I know if, if you do want to do conifer seedling ID, there aren't that many resources for it, but I wanted to sh share this resource that I found, uh, a very old botany book. Um, I don't know about other people, but I love old botany and horticulture books. They have just a different point of view. And I found this wonderful small guide for seedling identification for 25 conifers of the Pacific Northwest by Jerry Franklin. You can find it online. I happen to find this pristine copy. And this is the index of the conifers it covers, which is preceded by a key. And the photographs are of a quality that you would expect from a publication from 1961, but they're still, you know, very informative and the descriptions are, are wonderful. And it's, um, it's really a, a special little publication because when I was trying to identify a conifer seedlings, I had a, a terrible time finding resources. And um, this is one that I found that was really most helpful. It doesn't have every single conifer, um, but it has almost all of them that are native to the area. So conifers of the mountains um, are typically smaller and have a smaller footprint. I mean, not always, but the, the three conifers that that are small enough to sort of find a nice spot in an ornamental garden are the mountain hemlock, the subalpine fir, and the noble fir. Um, the noble fir is only native to Oregon and part of uh, Washington, doesn't 
go up into uh, Canada, but certainly of course the mountain hemlock and the subalpine fir do, but they're all three beautiful trees that um, fit well in a home garden. Some of them fare well, fare better than others, which I'm gonna talk about. Um, and they're typically dug up uh, and potted and taken off the mountain. And some, some species, uh, you know, tolerate that transition, which is quite diff difficult, better than others. Um, the mountain hemlock of the three uh, tolerates being moved off the mountain and planted in a, you know, in a lowland uh, landscape better than the others. Um, and being uh, obviously grown from seed, growing from seed, wild conifers have more variation than cultivars, which are typically clones and genetically identical. And this is even more typical for the mountain hemlock than other wild conifers. Um, in this one here is one picture of it in the wild where the foliage is quite green and the branches stick out quite horizontally from the, 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 the trunk. Um, and you can see this is just all, these are all little mountain hemlocks coming up all over the place. And, you know, in the wild, they can with time become very large trees, but in the home landscape, um, they typically don't ever live nearly as long, long enough to, to get that large, but, and they have this lovely small footprint and they grow slowly, uh, but they have variable form and variable, uh, colored foliage. Um, even though these two in the middle and the right are in the home landscape, they were dug from the wild and planted. And you can see the one in the middle has drooping branches and is somewhat blue green. And the one on the right here. It's very blue green and has very uh, horizontal branching. Um, so, and it's always true that when you pick out a plant, that you want to inspect it and you know treat it as an individual. But it's even that much more true when you're picking out a wild plant that is has uh, grown come into the world through seed and not through uh, propagation. Uh, mountain hemlock are largely pest free, but there is one pest that's uh, good to look for when you are buying a plant and they are susceptible to this parasitic mistletoe, which looks like this is this pale green twiggy growth. Um, uh, mistletoe has separate male and female plants and the female ejects the seeds forcibly from the plant and they're sticky and they land on a branch um, and then they germinate and burrow into the branch where they develop structures for three or four or five years before they emerge then as a plant to, uh, above the surface. So even if you do buy a, a mountain hemlock and it is free of mistletoe, it still can show up later on because it may be present inside the branch already. But it does, you can pull it off. It pulls off quite easily um, to, to limit the spread um, to other trees. Uh, the subalpine fir is, one of the most mag magnificent uh, firs on the planet, I think. Um, we're very lucky to have it native to the Western uh, America. Uh, however, it is uh, highly susceptible to an introduced pest called the balsam woolly adelgid. And it's called the balsam woolly adelgid because that is the first fir that it was uh, recognized on on the East Coast many, many decades ago but it has traveled out to the West and is a, a very severe pest of many of our true firs in the wild. And you see this subalpine fir on the left here um, has two specimens in it. The one on the left is uh, somewhat healthy. And the crown is intact and it has fairly nice lateral growth. Um, the, the adelgid tends to attack growing points, which are the, the branch tips and the crown of a tree. And this is um, this is typical. The crown is highly disturbed, and there's all this weak lateral growth, and it looks quite terrible. And uh, unfortunately for for firs, um, particularly our native firs, the cones are concentrated in the very top of the tree. And a tree that has been disrupted like this by the pest will not set cones. And so, in the wild, where this pest is prevalent. There is um, the seed bank is becoming impoverished, and the replacement of the uh, for the trees isn't quite happening because the, the seed bank isn't just there anymore. Um, these the middle and right picture are 
of two firms in the landscape, uh, one unhealthy, one healthy. <laughs> this one in the middle obviously has issues in the crown, just like the one in the wild. Uh, uh, they can struggle on uh, in a diminished state like this for, for a long, long time. So as long as you don't mind um, looking at a tree that's unhealthy, it will stay alive perhaps for even decades in, in, a, in a diminished state. This one on the right, um, is quite healthy. It's a landscape, uh, one in the landscape. It's probably 30 years old. It's setting cones. It was uh, in my neighbor's yard uh, a number of years ago, and I felt very fortunate to be able to look at it every day. So when they do prosper in the landscape, they have this perfect shape. They, they grow slowly, and they have a, a very uh, small footprint. Um, and so when you are inspecting, if you are going to buy a subalpine furs and put them in your yard, um, you wanna make sure to inspect them for this pest. Um, and even if it's not obvious, even if the crown looks okay and it, the, he the health of the tree in general looks good, you wanna look carefully at the buds and the growing these and the stems to see if there's any damage because buds like this will never recover. And that, that whole stem, firs don't back bud very easily. Um, particularly our native ones. And so this, this is going to compromise this, the growth of this entire branch for the rest of the life of the tree. Um, so you want to make sure you inspect your trees before you buy them. And this is on the right is what a bark infestation looks like, which is very, very serious. Um, if you see white material like this, that is the, um, the coating of the, of the adelgia, the protective white coating. And a bark infestation um, creates a, it is a serious for the tree and it will die very quickly. Whereas a, an infestation in the, um, the buds and in the crown, you know, the tree may live for a long time, but this is, will, will, will result in a speedy death. Noble firs also are susceptible to the pest, uh, not so much in the wild, but much more so, you know, off the mountain in the home landscape where uh, the conditions aren't so conducive. Um, Again, you can see this tree is quite old. It's quite tall, so it's been around for some time, but it's still alive. Uh, the crown is compromised. This is another way that you the crown can look if um, it's had a delta attack. It, it sometimes it has this weird splitting into like a, a like a scoop where the crown died out and it responded with like this kind of scoop top like that. Uh, and here on the right is one that is prospering. Um, this is sort of a rural and a rural area, uh, and it is just a magnificent tree. And uh, if, you know, some of the cultivars of our native, these native firs um, fare better in the landscape. Um, the cork bark fir, which is actually a, a cultivar of the, uh, the variant from the southeastern part of the U.S., uh, Abies Lazio Copper, Var Arizonica, um, does better in the landscape. This is a very small uh, specimen, but they do become very lovely small trees and they have very interesting bark, like the, uh, the common name indicates. Um, and this other one, I grew this in my yard. It's a small cultivar of the Abies Procera, the noble fir, and it was just the most darling tree. It didn't have any uh, insect damage. It grew slowly into this magnificent little kind of bonsai, you know, self bonsai tree. Uh, so, you know, I tend to, for these native trees of the mountains, I do have uh, some of the species, and, but I also grow the cultivars as well um, because they, they aren't quite as susceptible uh, to the pest. Okay, now I'm gonna transition over to talking about native conifers as ornamental plants. And, um, and I'm gonna start with the true firs. Uh, and one advantage of, of planting uh, European and Asian true firs is that they are not susceptible to this balsam woolly adelgid. Uh, the adelgid is native to Europe and co-evolved with the firs in Europe. And um, therefore uh, they, the, the insects do feed on the firs, but they're asymptomatic. And Asian firs are largely resistant and European firs are entirely resistant to the pest. So they are a good alternative for landscape uh, true firs, which is probably my favorite genus in the pine family. Um, this 
the two pictures I'm showing you here of, or of a cultivar called silver laka. I think that's how you can pronounce it. And um, another advantage of the Korean fir is that it sets cones at a young age. Uh, most uh, you know, of our like native two firs set cones only after many, many years, and they're typically restricted to high in the tree. And so you really don't get to see them and enjoy them and pr appreciate, appreciate their ornamental value. But uh, Korean firs set cones at a, a young age, and they set them also lower down in the tree. And this cultivar is a small tree, so you get to appreciate these cones right away. Oftentimes, it'll have cones right in the nursery pot. You don't have to wait for them. And they're beautiful, dark purple, and other colors as they're maturing. And they have exerted, exerted bracts like this, which are also a really lovely uh, ornamental touch. Um, male pollen cones are typically considered um, you know, of ornamental value, but I don't, not sure why, because on many conifers, the pollen cones are beautiful. I mean, they don't last as long as the female cones, but uh, they're in many cases, very, very colorful. As you can see on this cultivar here, um, these have already even lost some color, but um, they're beautiful and they're very plentiful. So when they do form, there's like a, a flush of color on much of the tree, so. This is probably my, uh, the Korean fir is probably my favorite uh, non-native uh, fir. Um, and also the foliage is extremely striking. Um, this is um, a picture of the entire tree of the silver locker. And you can see here, you can see, it's hard to see them, but there are the female cones and they're all here, all the, are, are, are male cones that have already released their pollen. And it's not a very old tree and it's already providing both male and female cones. Um, and it has this striking foliage, uh, the foliage upturns like this and the stomata on the underside are brilliant white. Um, and this is a, a smaller cultivar that has the same type of foliage, it's called icebreaker. This is a very young one. This is one that I have and it's just a, I think it's only three or four years old, um, but the foliage is beautiful. It reflects the light um, and it's very, very striking. Uh, and the stomata are the uh, pores on the underside of the leaves through which uh, gas is exchanged for the plant. Um, and the waxy coating is what you're actually seeing. There's a waxy coating around the, the opening to uh, lower the temperature. And uh, some plants like this, they form in, in very densely and you get this, this beautiful striking uh, whiteness on the underside of the foliage. My second favorite non-native fur is the Finnish, Spanish fur. And it has, um, oh, one thing I wanted to mention is that the Korean fur is endangered in the wild, like many, many uh, uh, conifers. So, uh, but it is plentiful in the horticultural market. Market And the Spanish fir is also endangered in the wild. It's native to um, either side of the Strait of Gibraltar. The Strait of Gibraltar at one time was um, closed. There was a land bridge there and it allowed species to pass back and forth between Europe and Africa. Um, and it has a very restricted range in the wild and it is endangered as well but it also forms cones at a young age and lower on the tree. Um, so you get to enjoy them. They're quite narrow and tall. They do not have exerted, exerted bracts and not as colorful as those of the Korean fir, but they're, they're, they're quite beautiful. And it's pollen cones are just remarkable. You know, you can see how they're just covering this tree um, and they contrast beautifully against the, uh, the blue green foliage here. And here's a, here's a profile of one cultivar. Um, and here's an up close uh, look at the foliage. And another striking thing, odd thing about the foliage is they're very, very, uh, of, the, of the Spanish fir is very plastic feeling. It, it, it doesn't feel natural at all. It's not sharp, um, but it's very plastic uh, feeling like vinyl. And they encircle the entire stem, which is unusual for true firs. It's typical for spruce, but it's um, not that typical for for, for uh, true firs. And so it's a another really lovely um, non-native uh, conifer that, that does very well in the landscape. 
and again is not susceptible to the uh, balsam woolly adelgid. I did want to talk about uh, one South American conifer just to, um, you know, show something different and that, you know, not all the conifers in, in, in the southern half of the planet have very different foliage than conifers in North America and Europe. Um, and just to sort of, it, ch it challenges our assumptions, assumptions about what conifers look like and what conifer foliage look like. Um, this is the monkey puzzle tree. It's a magnificent specimen that's growing at a a, a, port, a, a Portland nursery here. Um, I'm not sure how old it is, but that nursery has been there for probably 80 years and that tree could be that old. Um, it is native to Argentina and Chile. Uh, the genus is very old, it dates back to the Jurassic. Um, and uh, it is also a pioneer species. It moves in after volcanic eruptions and it is tolerant to poor volcanic soils. It's also salt tolerant. It goes along the, co the coast right quite easily and doesn't seem to be bothered by the salt at all. And uh, took a close up look at the foliage. Foliage is very non-user friendly. It's beautiful, um, but this is extremely sharp foliage here. Not pleasant to touch. Um, and botanists have speculated on what the uh, purpose of this foliage was, what you know, what advantage did it give the tree? Some have speculated since it was around, has been around since the time of the dinosaurs that it was developed, it, you know, is adapted an adaptation to be inedible by dinosaurs. And another botanist has speculated that it is supposed to look like a dinosaur to give the tree the look of a dinosaur to ward off herbivores. And if you also look at the the trunk of the tree here. Uh, many have said, wow, it looks like a uh, the trunk of a, looks like an elephant leg. And some have speculated, well, perhaps it looked like the, a leg of a dinosaur. And that would also scare off uh, herbivores. But uh, it sets these beautiful, large four to six inch uh, orb-like cones that disintegrate um, at maturity. They, each one of these has a seed in it. Um, they really are spectacular and they're they're all upturned at the, at the edge of, um, at the top of these branches like this. Um, truly, you know, this tree just has so much to offer. However, it does take a while to become magnificent. Here is a young specimen and you can see it. It's interesting, but it's not beautiful yet, but you know, it'll get there one day. Um, but they are, they are really uh, quite lovely trees. Uh, the next one I, I wanna talk about is the, um, the staghorn cedar, which is native to Japan, uh, Theopsis dolabrata, um, and only Japan. Uh, it's grown for its magnificent foliage uh, and the stomata on the underside. You have to flip over the foliage to, to appreciate it, but when you do, it's just, you know, you kind of gasp the first time you see it. It's just so remarkably beautiful. It has these very dense stomata on the underside and the rest of the, the, the leaf, uh, kind of creates a, a frame around the uh, the beautiful stomata. It is also, um, if we were in person, I'd pass it around so everybody could touch it. It feels like vinyl. It's very thick and it's very pliable, but it, it feels like vinyl. Um, such that it is a conifer you could probably identify blindfolded. Um, and it's very, these these scales are very raised up on the upper side that you could you could almost count them. Um, so the foliage is really um, the main reason why you would uh, plant this conifer. However, it also sets uh, really lovely cones. They're very rubbery and uh, kind of flower bud-like when they're young and they have uh, this beautiful kind of waxy coating that reflects the light. Over here is um, a variegated specimen. Uh, it's the same size as the species, which gets to about 30 feet tall. However, there are more shrub-like uh, cultivars available. And in fact, when I moved into this house that I'm in now a couple of years ago, I was delighted to find four of them growing in the back <laughs> um, because they aren't common, uh, but they're easy to grow. So they're worth seeking out. Um, they're, they're definitely worth seeking out. And the foliage, you know, would look lovely in, you know, some sort of uh, ornamental display inside, like a, a flower arrangement or a sort of a foliage arrangement. I know conifers aren't typically thought of as 
being worthy of, uh, you know, bouquets and things, but I, I really disagree with that. I think there's, there's many parts of the conifer that look lovely in a, in a bouquet. Um, my favorite ornamental pine uh, has been for a long time is the Japanese white pine, the Pioneer's Parpiflora. Again, of course, native to Japan. Um, there are many, many cultivars and uh, they all typically have short stiff needles with a lovely contrast, uh, which is typical of uh, pines of the mountains. Uh, the, um, the needles are typically short and stiff uh, for the, uh, the difficult harsh winter conditions. Um, another thing that recommends uh, white pine cultivars is that it sets cones at a very young age. Uh, even when in the nursery pot, you see this one here in the nursery pot has has cones all over it, um, which is typical of many pines. You Not know, all pines do this, but many pines uh, are exuberant cone setters and set cones at a, a very young age. Uh, pines uh, require two growing seasons to um, for, for cone development. And so the first year has very tiny cones. I think this is the spring and this is the, uh, these are the cones that were developed the previous season. And then you see they will develop and they will turn brown um, in the second growing season. And here's a full size cone here. Um, for, for Japanese white pine cultivars, the cone size tends to scale with the cultivar size, which isn't always the case uh, with other conifer species, but it's nice because they're, they're very diminutive and sweet and uh, they are sessile. They, they attach directly to the, to the stem without a stalk, um, which is typical of uh, the pines of the world where the seeds are harvested by birds. Being sessile and being attached to the stalk directly like that keeps the cone firmly in place so the birds can get them. So they want the birds. It is that, that adaptation you know, to allow easier access of the, uh, of the seeds for the birds. Um, rather than it shaking back and forth if it has a long stalk like the um, Western pine has a very, uh, Western ripe pine has a long stalk and it, and it sways. And that is to prevent birds from getting to the seeds. Uh, some uh, white pine cultivars have this uh, beautiful banded foli foliage. And so do some red Japanese red pine cultivars as well as um, I think some uh, black pine cultivars. Uh, and it's really striking and beautiful and unusual. These cultivars haven't been around for all that long. and first time I saw one, I was very confounded. It just sort of made my brain freeze. <laughs> now, what kind of conifer is that? But I just went back to the basics and I looked at the buds and I looked at the needles. And I'm like, oh, you're a Japanese, uh, you're a Japanese white pine or you're a Japanese white pine. So uh, it, they are quite unusual and quite stunning. Um, this one is the Ogun Janome. It gets so, somewhat large, but not terribly large compared to a Western white pine. Uh, there are many, many cultivars. Um, this Glauca here is one of the most popular. It's upright, uh, and I would caution people because it really does require more room than you think it will. And the branches at the center tend to, to grow very wide. Uh, so 15 feet tall plus 15 feet wide. Um, they can look nice in the small in the nursery pot, but you get them home and they start growing and uh, you may have a problem on your hands. Uh, this one over here to the right, the Aoi, is uh, probably my favorite current um, pine cultivar. <laughs> at, I'm growing uh, one in my yard and we're growing one in this garden that I volunteer at. And they uh, very slowly grow into beautiful trees with lovely structure. Um, and if they ever do get too large for the spot because they have a somewhat irregular growth, for, growth form, you can very easily prune them and they won't look, um, they'll still look beautiful. They won't look like you know, they're in the wrong shape. Uh, and these get to about four feet tall and two and a half feet wide, but that is over time, um, maybe 10 to 15 years. I wanna talk a little bit about um, Oriental Arborvitae, the Platycladus orientalis. Um, it's not as pop popular um, as it used to be in the garden because it's susceptible to a blight, a fungal blight uh, called Berkman blight. Um, but if they get what they want, like these magnificent specimens here, they can be incredibly stunning. They like 
full sun and uh, good air circulation. And these are very old specimens. I'm presuming them to be Orionena. They're 15 feet tall by eight feet wide. Um, this is at a pioneer cemetery that dates back to the 1800s, late 1800s. Uh, and the ones that you see in this picture are just a sampling of them. There's many, many sets of these throughout the, the cemetery and um, they're quite spectacular and they just quite kind of show you what, you know, a cultivar can do when it's, you know, been left alone, is getting what it wants. Um, it's just how magnificent they can become. Um, there, this is a, um, this cultivar is uh, particularly popular in cemeteries and cultivars like it, where they stay a perfect shape. As they grow, they just kind of maintain that perfect shape that they had as small plants and they don't need to be pruned. They don't need to be sheared. They stay this way for their entire lives. Um, this uh, cultivar was registered in France and I believe I think it was 1867. So it's a very, very old cultivar. Uh, Platycladus means broad branch um, and the fronds, the branches grow together parallel like the pages of the book, which is one reason why it's so susceptible to the blight because the foliage is very, very dense and inhibits air circulation. Um, but it's a very uh, interesting, uh, you know, orientation of foliage and very unique. And here you can see a branch is just, it's completely flat. It also sets beautiful cones, very quirky cones uh, that look like jester's hats. And they develop this beautiful pottery coating that reflects the light. Um, and I think would look really beautiful in a flower arrangement. Um, you can see each scale has an extension on it. So you can see the, the beginnings of the, you can see the marks between the scales of the cone and each scale has one of these delightful little extensions on it, um, which somewhat get obscured as the cone gets larger. Um, but uh, something, uh, you know, you don't see them so much anymore, but you know, they, they really, it's just really just, when I saw those at, at those specimens at the cemetery I nearly, uh, you know, I nearly crashed the car. <laughs> so, um, and they also set beautiful pollen cones in the winter. You know, um, winter is really a lovely time to interact with conifers. Uh, you know, you get a sunny day that's not too cold uh, because many conifers do set pollen cones in the winter. And although they're small, they can be very colorful and they cover, you know, vast parts of the tree. And so they're very, very visible. And this includes the, uh, the platycladus orientalis. It, it, it gets these very tiny but beautiful salmon colored pollen cones in the winter. Port Alfred cedar and Western red cedar also set, you know, very red and brilliant and beautiful pollen cones in the winter. If you happen to be out there looking around, um, you bring them in, you put them on your desk and you get, then you've got pollen <laughs> all over your desk. <laughs> anyway, uh, the platycladus orientalis is also, it, it is, uh, attractive to deer in the winter. Um, not quite as much as the emerald green upper body of the Thuya occidentalis, um, but the foliage is high in vitamin C and has most amino acids, um, which is why the deer eat it in the winter. It's important uh, winter forage for them. Uh, and it was also important winter, um, it was also important scurvy cure for uh, native peoples of Canada and the US. Uh, this scurvy was also a problem for them uh, in the winter and they made a tea out of the foliage uh, and they drank the tea. Um, I have to say when I was researching the book, I made myself some Thuya tea <laughs> and, um, and while it, it was very fragrant, but it actually wasn't nearly as uh, tasteful as uh, flavorful as it was aromatic. Um, and so I thought, well, yes, if I, if I had to, I could drink it, um, but I offered it to my dog who eats everything, including sticks and as a puppy's rocks, but, and, and he backed away when I offered it to him. So <laughs> that tells you something. Uh, so I did want to bring up one uh, problem, problematic uh, conifer, um, the Leland Cypress. Many of you may be familiar with it. It is a um, hybrid between two Pacific coast conifers, the Monterey Cypress and the uh, Alaskan Cedar. Uh, which grow nowhere near each other in the wild. 
the hybrid occurred on an estate in um, Britain in the late 1800s. And it's very vigorous. It has what's called hybrid vigor. It grows more vigorously than either parent. However, it gr does grow up to three feet a year. It has very dense foliage. The branches, it retains its branches all the way to the ground and it can be sheared, which is why it is sold as a hedge plant, as a hedge tree. Uh, but as you can see in this photograph, <laughs> It has taken control of these poor people's backyards here. Uh, and over here are the emerald green arborvitae, the Thuya oxygen talus, which you know is um, something we're all tired of, but it is the right plant for that place when there is a limited spot and you want a, a hedge to function as a fence. Um, and I probably a day doesn't go by that I don't see a misuse of this tree. Um, and in Britain, where they have been planting it far longer than we have over here. Uh, it is the source of many disputes between neighbors um, of, over blocked light and compromised views it's to the point that uh, parliament passed a law regulating its, its maintenance called the Lelandii Act. And uh, there are many criteria that the government puts forward for uh, neighbors to um, you know, fill in a spreadsheet to see if there's a, a grounds for uh you know a complaint to go forward so um it can get ugly <laughs> uh and here's a a follow-up this is a before picture and here's an after picture of this poor uh hedge or whatever you want to call it i mean you can shear these uh but most people don't because they just grow too fast the, the task is just difficult to keep up with and if you get to the point where you must prune it which most people do because they outgrow their spots and you haven't been sharing it, you'll have to cut into the branches, into the wood, and it will not grow back. So um, at some point, something's got to give. Uh, I'm going to finish talking about um, bald cypresses, which are very uncommon ornamental plant. Um, and they're the only conifers to grow in water, and they are deciduous. Uh, they're native to southeastern United States. But they are, even though they grow in water, they also are well adapted to dry land. They grow just fine on dry land. Um, but if you have a, a tricky spot, as many of us do, where there's a wet area near a pond or somewhere that water drains to, and you wonder, what can I grow there? Maybe you want to grow a conifer. Uh, Taxodium disticum is a really good choice. And there are smaller cultivars that are appropriate for the backyard. This is uh, the Blue River Reservoir in Central Oregon in late spring. This reservoir was formed in the 1970s and they planted bald cypresses to beautify the area uh, when the water is drawn down and to create um, stabilization of the soil. And they planted many, maybe 75 uh, of these bald cypresses at a gradient from the shore to the center of the lake. And the water in this lake fluctuates 100 feet a year. So it is full in the spring and early summer after the rains and the runoff. And then they draw it down to nothing before the rains uh, begin again in the, in the fall. So this is what it looks like in the late spring at you know peak water. Uh, some conifers, some of these conifers are, are underwater and you can't see them. So very tolerant of water. Here's a picture in late summer where they have start to, started to draw down the water. You can see it's a beautiful habitat for aquatic life. Uh, it would be nice to kayak around these. Um, they're quite beautiful. Some of them near shore were already out of the water entirely. And some that were had been underwater entirely were now above water. And here it is in the late fall where uh, the water has been completely drawn down and they're starting to lose their foliage. Uh, and uh, in the bald cypresses were often uh, form something called knees, which are extensions of the roots that come up through the soil and they're very interesting, but they don't all form them, particularly ones that grow in uh, deep water. And so scientists aren't really sure what they're for. People think they're for oxygenating the roots, but if ones that grow in deep water ha ha don't have them, how are the roots being oxygenated? And these do not have knees um, and they grow in very deep water. Um, so this is an interesting place in central Oregon if you're ever over there, um, it's east of Eugene 
um, between Eugene and the Cascades. Uh, and here's a, one cultivar I can recommend, the Peeve Minaret uh, is a smaller cultivar as a narrow footprint and you can shear it. Um, we probably all don't have uh, room for the for the whole tree, but it's uh, it's it can be hard to find. But if you have a tricky wet spot, it, it's worth um it's worth seeking out. And they get beautiful, beautiful multi tone fall foliage, uh, like this. This is a this is a the species specimen from the Hoyt Arboretum in Portland, and they have. Uh, these specialized cones that break apart at maturity. The only cones in the Cypress family that actually break apart. And they uh, break apart and travel by 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 water. The seed, each scale has um, one seed on it. And sort of the scale is kind of like a little boat and it travels down river or down wherever with the seed on it. Um, the seed is covered with resin, which protects it from water. And it has a little hook on it. Um, I don't have a picture of the hook here, um, but uh, so even though it travels by water, it must germinate on land. And so the hook is like a like a, like a boat hook, you know, it's made to hook onto land and um, so they can get out of the water and germinate. But it must, the water must, the, the soil must be saturated, even though it has to be land and not water, so it has to be saturated in order for it to germinate. So very interesting adaptations. Um, for conifer. Okay, questions?